And so we actually came together like on the spot and created this company, Absolute Rest, where we said, if you had to maximize sleep performance, and not sleep duration, sleep resilience, what would it look like? Well, I would want to know exactly how somebody's sleeping. And again, nothing about against consumer wearables. They're awesome. We use them at Absolute Rest. But we want to know exactly the highest precision gold standard. I want the same exact technology in a sleep lab in your house. We created that. We have full FDA approval. We can run full medical grade clinical sleep studies on people in their house. And now not only do we not only look at things like their sleep staging, you know, REM and things like that, but we look at fragmentation and stability within that. We can look at when you're on your right side versus your left side or your back, and we can start to see exactly how you're sleeping. And that's critical because below that, we now can then figure out why. So maybe you're having these mild apneas that wouldn't qualify again as a medical disorder, but they're only happening on your right shoulder. This is actually something that's happened many times. And now you get somebody off the right shoulder and their sleep apnea goes down by 90% in day one and never comes back. Mm -hmm. It's a slight pillow change. Um, we've had one recently where actually somebody was having a little bit of blocking of their nose at night, couldn't breathe through their nose, didn't realize it, went to mouth breathing. Happening because there was a little bit of dander stuff happening in his sheets. So all we had him do is start washing his sheets once a week instead of like once every couple of months, like most men do, right? <laughs> Dude's a housekeeper. <laughs> Boom. Problems are gone now, right? So there's sometimes really easy solutions, but we got those because we understood how he was sleeping at a gold standard level, and then we understood why. And so we look at blood markers. We look at genetic markers. We look at behaviors. Are there blood biomarkers for sleep? Totally. Like what? Absolutely. Well, you, you would start with basic stuff you would think of. Hematocrit, hemoglobin, ferritin, iron levels. Really good example. If you see somebody who doesn't exercise, they're unfit, but you see hematocrit and hemoglobin are really high, really good chance you've got some sort of apnea. Mm -hmm. Spleen will get, go nuts, right? If you're choking at night, your spleen will start kicking out red blood cells. You'll start to see uh, hematocrits 51s, 52s, mm -hmm. right? You start seeing hemoglobin 16s for men, a little bit lower. Women, you might see like 48 hematocrit, you start seeing hemoglobin's 13s, 14s. Yeah. Now I looked at it, one of my athletes and I'm like, great, we're fit. But you go, oh, you don't exercise at all. Hmm, great. Now you might just genetically have good markers there, but probably not. And then you start looking at things like MCV and other markers. And you just go down this whole line, you get into ferritin, like all these other markers, 20, 30 markers you could look at. And you start to realize, oh, these are high in the presence. And now you start looking at inflammatory markers, starting to get up there high. And you start to build this story. It's not one marker that you could just look at. It's this combination of things that you have to cross out for false positives, false negatives, and you start to see. But that first one, really high. And we know that's the case. There's a lot of data on this. If you have, take somebody that has apnea and put them on CPAP, hematocrit and hemoglobin will come down. You're like, oh, that's if they're, if they're, if they're elevated, right? They're if starting they're from oxygen, they make more red blood cells. Yeah, right. And you start to look at like, like 90 day distributions, of red blood cell size, and you start to see, oh, they're coming down. Why? Because those red blood cells don't have to hang on for 150 days anymore because they know they're, they're, they're out of limitation. So I know that was like a little bit technical, yeah. but no, no, interesting. Um, it's things like that where you can start to paint a picture and say, hey, now we're guiding towards different therapies. We don't need you to go on iron or we want whatever, like you get false senses. And low iron does lead to sleep disruption. Totally, right? Even, so, if, even if your blood count's normal, if you have low ferritin. Of course, right? And that's going to happen in over probably 30% of physically active people. Which super, people don't super realize. And the doctors usually don't check. No, not at all, right? So you want to look at a bunch of markers there. As part of function health, we do all that, which is really pretty amazing. We're seeing, you know, a lot of people deficient. Yeah, right? you can actually start to see indications of those from the blood first. So you start to see those things pop up. Your algorithms that function are probably going to flag and say, hey, how's your energy? Mm -hmm. Oh, sub subjective questionnaire is low. Interesting. Here, you should go get a sleep study done. Like, don't get it done to hospital. Get it done at home so we can do three or four or five nights, not like one weird night at a sleep hospital where- Where you're all like, wired up and it's strange. Yeah. yeah. All those wires are, you don't need them anymore. Like the technology can be done all wirelessly. Yeah. Right. So this can be done and then have that analyzed and looked at and say, okay, great. Actually, we don't need medication yet. We need actually to improve sleep and then get out of the way. Yeah. The body will actually recover back how it wants to. We don't have to over-medicate, over-supplement. So what are the most common things you're seeing with sleep and the lack of sleep resilience? And how do you get people towards a better sleep resilience? Yep. So the step number one we already covered, more consistent. Consistent is always our starting place, as close as we can within that. Past that, uh, we, I started talking about the wind-down index. Why I brought that up? 
if you look at something like sleep onset latency, how long it takes you to fall asleep at night, right? The general numbers there are going to be five to 20 minutes, right? So if you're falling asleep within like two minutes, that's probably a good sign that you're sleep deprived. It takes you 20, 25, we're going to have other issues falling asleep, especially 30 plus minutes to fall asleep on average per night. All right, we don't have a good fall asleep strategy. Here's why this stuff matters. If you are exhausted, you might fall asleep really, really quickly. But if you're not physiologically wound down, you'll oftentimes wake up at two in the morning, three in the morning. Boom. Kind of tired, but wired, yeah. Tired and wired, right? You'll fall asleep from exhaustion, but you'll only get those three or four hours. Can't go back to sleep. Then you'll look at blood glucose and you know that's going to be, that's going to be the problem, right? And so it's not necessarily a carbohydrate issue in this particular case. It's the fact that you're, uh, look at your resting heart rate, look at your pulse wave, look at uh, sort of these cardiopulmonary measures, and you'll start to see other signs that corroborate you're asleep, but you're not downregulated. You're really pretty wired. Um, so the common person of, a lot of people wake up at the middle of the night at some point, but the, it happens all the time. I may be sweaty. I may be out of breath. I can't get back to sleep. That's going to tell us, okay, we're not winding down. So in that particular case, you build resiliency by saying, I know I'm going to have a limited window today, or I'm off schedule, fine. I can get better at that by having a consistent wind down routine, because that will actually down regulate me and give me more quality sleep in those same hours, because I'm not spending the first 40 minutes actually trying to just bring my heart rate down or. So wind down, hours. like hot bath, you know, meditation. It's incredibly individual. Breath work, yoga. Some of them are great. Um, what's really key to wind down routines, it is not the act, it's the pattern. Yeah. The number one key to wind down routine is to have some consistent thing you're doing. Whether that consistent thing is even whatever, right? It can be journaling. Mm -hmm. It can be write down the things you have to do tomorrow, fine. Those things might not work for you. Mm -hmm. What you want is the 60 to 90 minutes prior to sleep to be doing the same-ish things that you do. If that is, you, all those things you mentioned, fine, great. Love them all. I don't do any of those really. Like they don't work for me. But you want to kind of do the same things. What do you order. do? Um, so for me, we have little kids. So we're yeah, always going to go through the little kid routine, right? We're doing all the things in order at the pretty much the same times with the kids. That's my pattern too. Because I'm going through that. Like that's tremendous joy. That's I'm being present. I've checked out of work. I'm not on my phone. I'm not doing emails. I'm reading stories. We're doing all the things and wrestling with the kids and making mom mad because I'm wrestling with kids five minutes before bed. But that 40 minute routine with my kids is my first 40 minute. That is my internal signal that I'm done for today. I don't care what else happens. I'm not checking my email when I'm playing with my kid. Mm -hmm. Not going to happen, right? From there, then I'm going in, we're going to shower. That's great. And then I'm getting in, I'm a thousand percent going to watch TV. You're going to watch TV? hundred percent of the time. Huh. Like TV will be on. I might watch a Seattle Mariners game. I might watch whatever. I'm not watching like a murder mystery, but we'll watch oftentimes like 20 to maybe 40 minutes of TV. The blue light doesn't bother us at all. We use environmental sensors. So we're testing everything. We're looking at melanopic light, not just total lux. Like we have everything measured and monitored. All this technology I use myself. So I can objectively say that stuff does not negatively impact my sleep, but it positively impacts my psychological downregulation. It is a click in my what brain. What if your team loses? Is that? I don't know. <laughs> Ask my wife. She'll say different. That's but, a stress. <laughs> yeah. But for me personally, like I really enjoy that stuff, but I don't do it very often. So when the TV like goes on for me, it is a huge click that, okay, you're done. Mm. That's it. All that other stuff on your phone, it does not matter. All you're worrying about is like what the three, two pitches on the sixth inning yeah. for the fourth batter. Like what's he going <laughs> to throw a curveball? He's going to go off speed. Is he tunneling that pitch? Like... Yeah. And then my wife will generally read or she's watching the same thing too, right? But that's her thing too, right? She's like, I can get lost in this book now. Now I don't have to worry about anything else. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here.